So when you speak about the excretion weight, this is basically the amount of uh, the substance that is leaving the body that is being removed in the urine. And this is equal to how much of that substance is being filtered plus how much of that substance is being secreted minus how much of that substance is being reabsorbed. Okay, and if we kind of do some basic math here, that'll make a little bit more sense. So if we filter a certain amount of substance across the glomerulus, that is how much was being filtered. If we add to that number how much was being secreted, that is how much is moving from the blood back into the tubule. And then we're gonna subtract out how much is being reabsorbed because we know that is going from the tubule and back into the blood. And what we're left with is our amount of uh, the substance that is being excreted. That's our excretion weight. This is going to depend on the filtered load of that substance or particle, the secretion weight of that substance or particle, and the reabsorption weight of that substance or particle. And so we can, we can calculate the excretion weight for a lot of different particles. We won't go into the details of that just because of the, um, the limitations of time, but we will speak about the general principles in terms of the total osmolarity of solutes, okay? Um, now, before we look at uh, the exact, um, before we look at an example of the total osmolarity movement and the total excretion based upon that osmolarity, let's talk about the trend that we see in terms of these three processes. So if the amount of a solute is excreted per minute is less than the amount that's filtered, we know that that solute was reabsorbed. Okay, I'll say that again. If the amount of that solute that is excreted, right, the amount that's leaving the body, is less than the amount that was filtered, we know that some of that solute had to go somewhere else, so it must have been reabsorbed. Likewise, if the amount of a solute that is excreted is greater than what is filtered, we know that we got some additional solute from somewhere else, so that solute must have been secreted, okay? So let's look at the overall osmolarity of our tubular fluid, and let's talk about the four processes that are involved here. So let's talk about filtration. So filtration is where we squeeze our plasma across the glomerulus, and so in the tubular structure in the first part of the Bowman's capsule, we have an osmolarity, an overall osmolarity of 12 millimoles. And so again, we can look at the individual osmolarities or the individual filtration weights of different particles. But in the interest of time, we're not gonna look at individual particles. We're gonna look at the overall solute concentration or the overall osmolarity of the tubular fluid. So we start off with a filtrate that has an osmolarity of 12 millimoles. Um, and then gradually, as we have secretion occurring, we end up with an osmolarity of 15 millimoles. And that tells us that three millimoles of particles were secreted back into this tubular fluid. Now, after reabsorption takes place, we end up with an osmolarity of nine millimoles, and that's because six millimoles of particles were reabsorbed back into the blood. So we're gonna subtract out that nine, um, that six millimoles, and we're left with an osmolarity of nine millimoles. And so that is our weight of excretion. That's our excretion weight. And that is what we're left with in the tubular fluid after we add the particles that were secreted and we subtract the particles that were reabsorbed. Okay. All right. I hope that makes sense. Uh, let's see. I got a question here. Is it possible to extend your loop of Henle? Very, very good question. Um, this is not possible to extend in terms of one human to the other, but evolutionarily over time, it is thought that humans have been extending our loops of Henle. Um, and that is because we're able to go for longer periods of time, especially if we live in a desert climate, um, and then if we don't live in desert climates, we can actually reduce, again, evolutionary, so over time, um, our loops of Henleys if we're not going for extended periods of time without water. But that's a really good question. Um, but this, this doesn't happen like on a day-to-day -day basis, but more over time as a feature of evolution. Really good question. 
Okay. Um, all right, so here's another table, again, not for you to memorize, but for you to be familiar with in terms of what's happening with clearance. So we're not gonna speak a lot about clearance, um, but we will talk about some of the important features of clearance. And so these are the rates of things that are cleared throughout the kidneys. And when we speak about clearance rate, this is how much of uh, a certain particle or a solute is excreted from the kidneys or excreted from the body as a function per minute. So it's the milliliters per minute of these solutes that are excreted or cleared from the body. And the general rule of thumb is that if the clearance weight is greater than the GFR, then net secretion has taken place. Whereas if the clearance weight is less than the GFR, then net reabsorption has taken place. And we can see that being reflected by these clearance weights and these um, net movement of these solutes. And so I wanna point out here creatinine. So creatinine is a breakdown product of muscle metabolism. And it's going to be, um, if you remember that creatine, creatine phosphate system we talked about as a backup source of ATP production for our skeletal muscle, that creatine, if it's produced in excess, is an indicator of muscle metabolism. And that is actually converted to creatinine, and that is excreted from the body as a byproduct. This is another reason that excess protein consumption, so if you're eating a lot of protein in the diet, this puts quite a bit of strain or stress on the kidneys because then the kidneys have to clear this excess creatinine from the body, from the plasma. And so what we see is that the weight of creatinine clearance is about 140 milliliters per minute. And so it's greater than the GFR, which is 125. So that tells us that creatinine is secreted. So it's going to be moved from the tubular, from the uh, peritubular capillaries into the tubular space, and it's going to be uh, cleared from the body at a weight that's faster than our GFR. Um, creatinine is another uh, one of those uh, molecules or substances that we look at to determine um, kidney function. So when a doctor is looking at your overall kidney function, how healthy your kidneys are, they typically look at how well your creatinine is being cleared from your body. Um, so if you're holding on to creatinine, that is an indicator that your kidneys are not clearing or not functioning as well as they should, because there shouldn't be any creatinine being held back or being reabsorbed. Okay. All right. Um, so that brings us to objective four, and this is really having to do with micturation. So we're gonna describe the events that occur during micturation. So micturation is the final stage of um, avoiding or clearing these excrete, these excrete products from the body. So this is how we actually get rid of all of this waste that we've been accumulating, that we've filtered out, that we've fine-tuned as the urine, and now we can send it down to the bladder to be stored and eventually be eliminated from the body. So micturation is the fancy term for urination or peeing. And this is where we um, release that filtrate from the bladder um, into the urethra to be excreted from the body. So the fluid that is formed in the kidneys drains into the renal tubules, it drains into the renal pelvis, it then goes into the ureter. So from both kidneys, we drain into the ureters on both sides, and then all of that is dumped into the bladder where it is stored until we get the urge to urinate. And so I'm gonna go through the basic control mechanism of micturation here because there are three main uh, parts of the nervous system that are playing together to bring about micturation. There's the parasympathetic system, there's the sympathetic system, and then there's also the somatic component. Because we know that micturation is not just an involuntary process, but we do have some voluntary control over how micturation or how and when micturation occurs. So first of all, the detrusive muscle is lining um, 
the bladder. So it's the actual skeletal muscle um, that lines the bladder. Um, not skeletal, I'm sorry. It's the actual autonomic or smooth muscle. This is smooth muscle that lines the bladder. And so we don't have control over the bladder. And this is connected via gap junctions. And this is what helps the bladder to uh, contract synchronously and to relax synchronously. It's innervated by the parasympathetic neurons, which release acetylcholine. And that is how we get the urge to contract and release that urine that's being stored or relax and store more urine. Now, there are sphincters that are surrounding the bladder, surrounding the opening of the urethra. There are two sphincters involved here. There's the internal urethral sphincter, which we do not have control over. This is smooth muscle. This is preventing the leakage of that stored urine from exiting the bladder. And then there is the external urethral sphincter, which is distal to the internal sphincter. And this sphincter is skeletal muscle, meaning that we do have voluntary control. And so when we get the stretching sensation of the bladder, meaning that the bladder has been full beyond a certain capacity, this sends signals to uh, S2 to S4, regions of the sacral spinal cord, that does two things. It's going to inhibit the parasympathetic system to the detrusor muscle, while it's, uh, the somatic motor neurons to the external sphincter are going to be stimulated. So we're going to block the parasympathetic innervation to the detrusor muscle, and we're going to stimulate the somatic or the voluntary nervous system to the external urethral sphincter. So those two things need to happen in conjunction in order to, um, to uh, stimulate the urethral sphincter or to keep the bladder closed, okay? So this is called the guarding reflex. So until the external urethral sphincter is stimulated, the parasympathetic system is inhibiting the detrusor muscle from voiding. Okay, and that's why you don't pee on yourself even though the bladder is full. The external urethral sphincter is really controlling the parasympathetic innervation to the bladder muscle itself. So this prevents us from emptying the bladder unless we absolutely want to. I'll take a pause here for a question. So someone's asking, what does micturation equal? So micturation is urination. That's the same thing. Micturation is the same thing as voiding the bladder or urinating. Okay. Um, now, in order to actually void the bladder, in order, in order to actually prevent, um, in order to actually void or uh, urinate or to let that bladder out, um, a few things have to happen. So the information about stretch on the bladder is sent to the higher centers in the brain, so the pons, which are the integrating centers of the autonomic nervous system. And then that sends out two signals, a parasympathetic signal that is going to allow the detrusor muscle to contract. That's going to actually contract the bladder muscle itself. And then we're going to inhibit the sympathetic innervation, which is going to relax the sphincter the internal urethral sphincter, which is going to open up the opening that leaves the bladder. And then the person is going to feel the need to urinate, and then they will control the external urethral sphincter. Okay, so there are really three things that are happening in order for someone to successfully urinate. And I kind of summarize those using this flowchart here. So a bladder is full with blood, with uh, not blood. The bladder is full with fluid, with urine. The wall of the bladder is going to expand or stretch. These stretch receptors are going to send signals to the higher centers and the pons, um, where we've got these integrating centers. The integrating centers are going to send signals down to our autonomic structures. The first signal is going to be to tone down the sympathetic innervation. That's going to help you to relax the internal urethral sphincter. The second, signal, the second signal is going to be to tone up the parasympathetic activity. That is going to cause contraction of the detrusor muscle itself. And those two things happening in conjunction will allow urine to leave the bladder and make its way out into the urethra. 
The third signal is where you come in. This is your actual control of your external urethral sphincter. This is skeletal muscle. So this is when you have, you have voluntarily decided to use the bathroom or to avoid, and that is where you relax the external urethral sphincter, you open up that sphincter, and the urine can then leave the body. Okay, so there are three different divisions of the nervous system that are playing together nicely in order for micturation to be brought about.